if you want. Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you, Lord. It's all about you, Lord. And thank you for this time we get to be together, come together as family. And I pray every person that's here, Lord, they, they would know your love, your amazing love, like you demonstrated your love for us so clearly, willing to lay your life down for us. And so I pray that each one of us would know your love in a greater way and even today to experience it. I pray these things. Amen. All right. Be seated. Smile at somebody and look in their eyes. Okay. Thank, thanks for coming, everybody. Are you ready? I guess you're supposed to buckle your seatbelts. Uh, all right. I, um, does anybody have radiators in your home? Like we have, a, we have an oil tank. We've got the radiators. And um, so have you noticed if you look really closely and get like your phone light on, and you get really close, you look down back behind it, have you noticed that the paint is a different color than the rest of the walls in the house? <laughs> and um, that bothers me. And I'm like, man, I got to do something about that thing. Some of you, does that bother some of you? Some, some of you, raise your hand if that bothers you. I know we got issues. We got issues. Oh, there's a few of us. We got issues. You know, what, what I've learned, though, is that some problems are worth ignoring. They're not worth the effort <laughs> to do something about that. You got to take the whole system out, call the plumber and all that kind of stuff. But, but there are some problems that you need to be aware of. And some problems are big problems, but we're like unaware that they're a problem. So, for example, um, as a dad now, I'm thinking pretty soon my kids are going to want to drive. That's <laughs> being a problem, but let me, let me keep going. One of the things that I have to teach them early on is about the dipstick. You have to check the oil. Do you know? Because if you run out of oil, you may not realize it, but it's going to be a big problem. Why do I know that? Because as a teenager, I blew up an engine because I ran it without oil. Pray for my parents. My dad's still working out. <laughs> so sometimes we have problems that are worth ignoring because they're, you know, it's fine. It's grand. It's not really a problem. But there are some problems that we don't realize are a problems, are a problem until the problem really hits us. And today, the message that I want to share is kind of like that type of problem, where we may not be aware that it's a problem. Sure, it's grand. This car is beautiful. Look at the paint job. But actually, underneath the hood, there can be a big problem. Okay, and, and so I'm sharing this because this is something for me, but I believe this is something for, for all of us to be aware of. Okay, so there's this story in Numbers chapter 13. If you have your Bible and you want to look at that, I'm just going to kind of tell you the story. But if you want to follow along, you can. And this is the story of Israel. Say Israel. Israel were a nation called by God. And um, they had been slaves. You remember, they grew as a nation. They grew from a family into a nation and they were very successful, but then they became slaves under the Egyptian kings there. And while they were slaves, God came to a man named Moses in this burning bush situation and came to him and said, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. So Moses responded to the Lord. He went to Egypt. He spoke to Pharaoh. And eventually, the people of Israel left Egypt they were standing at this big sea, and they were stuck between a sea and a hard place because the army was coming after them. God opened up this sea. They moved through the sea, and their enemies went into the sea, and the sea closed over them. 
This was the deliverance of God's people. This was their salvation. Movement from bondage and death into a new reality with God. When they left this situation of bondage and went through the sea, do you know where they went into? Somebody say it out loud. Into the desert, into the wilderness. But where were they going? Somebody say it out loud. The promised land. They were heading in a direction toward the promised land. You know this land? It's the land of milk and honey and really good berries tea. So they, they were headed in this direction of the promised land. And this is where we find them. They've spent time in the wilderness, but God's desire was to teach them some things in the wilderness, but ultimately not to leave them in the wilderness, but to what? To move them into promise of blessing and so much more, that things that they couldn't even hardly imagine and dream of. And that was the direction they were headed into. So God comes to Moses after uh, the season of going through the wilderness, and he says to Moses, Moses, now what I want you to do is I want you to find the leaders of Israel of the 12 tribes, and I want you to choose these 12 leaders to go in and survey the promise. I want them to enter into the land that I have promised and bring back a report of what's going on there. Okay, so Moses gave them instructions, and he sent the 12 men into the promised land. These were the instructions to explore the land. Go there, see what the land is like. It says in Numbers 13, 18. See what the land is like. So they're going to look at the land. Find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. They're going to look at the people. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back a sample of the crops because this was the harvest season for the grapes. So these people went in and they were to make a report of the promised land and bring it back to the people. So after exploring for 40 days, the men returned. And this was the report that they gave to Moses. They said, we entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed bountiful country. It's amazing country. A land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit produces, it produces. So they showed this cluster of grape that it took two men to carry, and it was crazy amazing. So bountiful. But... But, there's always a but, isn't there? But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Then they go on to describe all the different people groups, and it was a scary situation. The Amalekites are here. The Canaanites live here. The Hittites are here. The Amorites are here. The Canaanites, all these different ites. And Caleb is one of the 12 there, standing there. Joshua, Caleb, and a big group of 10. And the 10 are giving this report, and Caleb's like, shh. In the midst of them giving their report, Caleb's like, but the land is amazing. And if we go take it now, we got it. That's Caleb. Powerful. So what happened? the rest of the group began to challenge what Caleb was saying as he challenged what they were saying. These 10, I think, probably thought they were giving a good report. They were doing what Moses asked them to do. Tell us how is it? What is, what's good? What's bad? What's scary? What's not? So they're giving a logical report. But how many know that this was not just a logical report? This was actually a bad report. And Caleb's like, shh, don't listen to all that. Because why? God is with us. Their report 
was magnifying the obstacles and the giants, but Caleb's report was magnifying God. Two different reports. I think they both thought they were good. It's all good. The car is all good. Look at the paint job. Wait, look under the hood. There may be a problem with what you're saying. So they, it says then the people that heard this report from them in uh, verse 14 or chapter 14, it's, I love the wording that it uses. It says, after hearing this report, because they said the giants were huge. The, the land will devour anybody that goes to it. We were like grasshoppers in our eyes, and we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. We can't do it. And it says the people heard this, and they brought up a great chorus of dread, a great chorus of protest. Oh, I'm just thinking of a song. We can't do it. They're singing the song of protest, of why it's not going to work. Why, although God promised it, we should go back to where we were. We would have been better off dead. They're singing their song. We would have been better off dead in Egypt than going to be killed into the promise. Ever sang that song? Okay, we won't. Don't raise your hand. So the people are crying out. Then Aaron and Moses fall to the ground. Joshua and Caleb are ripping their tunics, and they're saying, guys, we got to believe God. Stop doing that. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Okay, so that's the, that's the story. I think you may see where I'm heading. I, I want to talk about the situation. So they sur surveyed. They did a survey. Um, they examined and made a record of the area and features of an area of the land so as to construct a map, a plan, or a description. Moses sent these people in to look at what God promised was for them. Look at the life that God said belonged to them. It wasn't just a land. It was about a life that he was inviting them into that they weren't going to just earn it, but he was going to give it to them. And so they made a survey. I don't know if you've ever done that. Have you ever made a survey? But that's what he called them to do, make a survey. And so what's interesting about this to me is because whenever I think of the promised land, I think of the land of milk and honey, the land of ever-flowing Coke Zero, leather couches, uh, free sky sports. What else? What else? <laughs> Promised land. Oh, just relaxing and chilling. Like 22.5 degrees. Um, nice breezes. When it rains, it only happens at night. That kind of, that's the promised land, you know? But do you know that the, that was not fully what the promised land was? And what I want to propose to you today that God invites us into his promise. And his promise not only includes the blessing of the, the kettle that is always on the boil, with the, with the you know what I'm saying? The, the sky sports always, you know, Manchester City always winning. Yeah? Um, and all those kind of blessings, but what also is part of the promise is adventure. Can you say adventure? Part of the promise of entering into what God has for us is that he doesn't just invite us to the leather couch, but he invites us into adventure. And so let's look at that. What is adventure? Let's just get real clear here. Adventure is a risky undertaking of unknown outcome. Isn't that what you want to be invited into? <laughs> Adventure. It's a little bit like going to Ikea with my wife. You never know what's going to happen, what you're going to come home with, how much money you're going to spend. Who knows? It's risky. You're entering the unknown. 
This is the journey. Adventures are risky. Did you? Adventures have risks associated with them. Um, getting married. Risky business. I, uh, I was listening to a song, and the singer, I think he was 34 years old when he wrote the song, um, but it's a song about him getting married. And the song starts something like, I was 19, you were 21 when we decided to get married, and we were dancing in the minefields. We went dancing in the minefields. Isn't that great lyrics? If you've been married... You know what he's talking about. You're dancing in the minefields. What's he saying? When you get married young and you enter into a covenant relationship until death do you part, you are with them. When you're entering into that, there are some minefields. Somebody say amen. amen. It's, it's challenging. There are things you have to grow to learn from each other, to serve one another, to die to certain things, to live for other things. This is risky business, marriage. All right, smile at me, okay? Don't elbow anybody. Life is full of risk. Get, have children. Move to a new country. Try to buy a house. Risky business. See if you can start a business. And, you know, enter into doing some sort of ministry. Try to do something for God that you feel like he's called you to. I promise you, if he's called you to it, you are entering into risky business. Why? Because when we walk with God, we learn not to just rely on ourselves. We learn to rely on him. And he always pushes us beyond our own boundaries. He always... So, so that's, my, that's what I'm trying to get to you today. That, that Christianity is not just a movement towards tranquility. Christianity is a movement of adventure. Following God is a movement of adventure. Okay, let me keep, I'll try and keep myself not getting lost. There are unknown outcomes. And so he sent them in and he said, make this report. And I know some of you you, you make reports for your work, and reports are great. They're, they're meant to be simple and clear, right? That's what a report does. It's simple and clear. You, you make a plan for what you're going to do for the year. It should be simple and clear. But how many know that that's great for plans and that's great for reports, but for living and for pursuing a dream from God, it gets messy, because once you start to live, very often that little plan or report has got to change because life is messy. Did you know that life is messy? Maybe you didn't want to hear that at church today. You wanted me to sort everything out. Life is messy. Somebody tell me amen over here. I need, they need your help over here. L life is messy. It, and walking with God is an adventure. And there's mystery, and there's challenge, and there's movement, and there's can be fears and anxieties, and things don't always go the way you thought they would go. But guess what? Welcome to walking with God. Smile at me now. Okay? All right. There is... Um, this is, um, this is the story of Christianity. And, you know, for me, it's, it's sad sometimes when I talk to people in Ireland, but all over the world, and they think that church is doing what we're doing right now. Like coming into a big building with a bunch of people, sitting down, standing up, singing a few songs, listening to somebody talk, and then go home and have the roast. They think that's what, like, Christianity, and that's, this is good. Like, I, I'm committed to this. I do this every week. This is so good. But there is so much more than what Christianity, it's meant to be an adventure. And it's a shame that so many people don't realize that. And, but that's, I mean, you got to read the Bible. Have you read the Bible? I, th I think people, they go and they see a big old building, you know, half filled with old people. 
no, nobody their age maybe, and they think, oh, that's church. That's not church. Church is an adventure. Smile at me. Church is walking with, this is walking with God. This is not like other stuff. So I just had to get that out of my system. <laughs> Sorry. So, so there's two things I just want to really quickly share. Two things, okay? There's, there's a tension in Christianity. The first tension is, is that part of walking with Jesus is that we receive. We receive from God, okay? We receive, and, and this is what we call faith. This is salvation. Um, sometimes we were, talk, we were talking with a friend the other day, they said, I'll never be good enough to get into heaven, like joking, and they're not a believer. But I, I kind of wanted to say, exactly. Exactly. You'll never be good enough to get to heaven. That's right, because you won't. But with the gospel, the gospel, what Christianity is about, it's called good news. Have you ever heard of that? Good news. And the good news is that you aren't good enough, but God is. He is so good that he makes you good enough through Jesus Christ. Jesus, the perfect man, died for your sin. Every mistake, everything wrong that you've done, everything that you've tried to be good in, all of that, Jesus was perfect. And you identify yourself with him. And when you identify yourself with him, it's like you're sitting down into the work of God. I'm putting my life and I'm trusting God to hold me up. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm just going to receive the goodness of God. Say receive. Receive. So God comes to us. This is the good news. Religion says you got to earn your way to God. I got to do it, do it, figure it out. But the gospel says God's reached out to you. And so we sit down into that. Ah, oh, isn't that good to receive? Ah. Oh. But on the other hand, there's another tension. And that tension is that faith requires not only receiving, but it requires following. Part of our journey as believers who have received the goodness of God, I am a child of God now, I am secure, I'm going to heaven because of God's goodness to me, but also I need to follow I need to follow him. Wherever he's going, I got to go with him. And this is the adventure that I'm talking about, Christianity is about. So sometimes we get so focused on the receiving that we forget the following. Sometimes we can get so focused on the following that we forget the receiving. But you've got to have both. You want to have both. And so this is discipleship. So look at what Jesus says. Because I'm, I'm trying to show you that that you are meant to be living an adventure. Look what he said. Here's his words. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Like, could it be more clearer? And he's, a he's even more extreme than what I'm almost presenting to you, isn't he? He's like, you got I need it all. I want you, all of you. I'm talking about everything. I so come follow me. And, and this is his story. So God calls us to a life of adventure where there's mystery, where there's unknown outcomes, where there's risk, where everything doesn't go according to the way we think it should go, according to the plan that we had. Why? Because we're not following ourself. We're following God. All right. So, you know, if you, um, they say if you play it safe, you're going to lose. Did you know that? And my kids, um, last year, the year before, they play hurling. Any hurling families in here? Oh, yeah, there we go. Come on now. Hurling is an amazing sport. You can really learn about God. <laughs> play, play hurling. <laughs> All the moms are like, no way. So my, my kids were playing hurling. And they're, you know, they just send these kids out with axe handles. 
and they want him to go swing them around at each other trying to get a ball. And it's crazy. Thankfully, now they wear helmets. But So I'm watching my kids, and they're just learning. And they had their, their first match. And I see my daughter. She's got her axe handle. And all the kids have been playing maybe a couple years longer than her. And she's like this. The ball's like in there, and she's like, ooh. And I'm watching this. And uh, I'm getting excited. Same, same thing with my boys at first. Right? Because you don't get the head knocked off of you. You know what I'm saying? But what am I doing? I'm yelling at them. Come on now. Drive it into them, Jewel. Get in there. Come on now. <laughs> All right. Get in there. If you want to win the game, you got to take a risk. If you don't risk, you're going to lose. You're not really playing the game, actually. And the challenge is, is that none of us want to get a hit. You know, I'm a Christian. God's got me all the time. He's with me. Listen, you're going to take a hit. Sorry. Somebody tell me amen. Some courageous person out there. If you're going to, if you're going to do stuff with the Lord, sometimes if you're going to really get in there, you're going to take a hit. So I said, I said this before. Jesus said, I'm just doing a rabbit trail for a second. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Okay? That's a good message. That's a true message. That's not today's message. Okay? I believe that message. It's blessing. Today I'm saying, so if we're going to go with God... We're not just doing a Sunday thing, chilling the rest of the week. We're like going with God. And we got to just drive it into him sometimes. You got to like get in there and take a few like come home with some bruises. Come on now. Yes. That's the way. Get in there. So don't, don't play it too safe. I was, um, I was in Edinburgh with my brother-in-law a number of years ago. And we went to the Bank of Scotland there. And in the downstairs, they have a museum of, I think it's like a museum of money. And in the Museum of Money, they have a million pounds um, stacked up underneath this thick plexiglass. I don't know what other kind of security systems they have. But isn't, that was so cool. If you're ever in, in, in Edinburgh, you should go see it to actually see what a million pounds looks like. And I was like, whoa, I couldn't fit that in my car <laughs> on the Ryanair flight. Uh, so anyway, I was looking at that. I was thinking kind of like a representation of our life this money, right? And if you pry, try to protect it, it does no good. If you try to box your life in from all risk, you are headed for an even bigger risk. Does that make sense? They, they box this stuff in. It was never spent. This is what I'm going to do. It's safe. Protected. But also, I don't know if you can read it. On the note in blue ink stamped on every single bill is the word canceled. Canceled, 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 canceled. When you spend the money, it's working. It's living. It's doing what it was made to do. When you try to protect it and block it off from all risk, it's not fulfilling what God made it to fulfill. Same with our lives. Don't protect yourselves from all risks. This is not what God has called us to. So here we go. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That's a profound statement, actually. You ponder that one for a while. Because what we think about God has an effect on our heart and on our actions. And so I want to ask you, do you know God as the God of adventure? Do you know him like that? Maybe he's more like the God of the boring. Or maybe he's like the God of the old people. I'll think about him when I get older. 
I'll have my fun now. But actually, he's the God of adventure. And <clears throat> so this is what Moses was trying to come to grips with. Because he, when God came to him and said, I want you to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, bring them out. Moses was like, okay, whoa. This was crazy because the burning bush was talking to him and it was amazing for him. But one of the questions he asked before he would go is, who am I supposed to tell them you are? And the voice of the Lord said to him, I am who I am. This is his name. It's Yahweh, or another way of saying it is Jehovah. And what does that mean? It means, I am reality itself. I am the all-existent one. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. And so Moses ended up bringing that to the people. But what, what was happening was that God, he, like, he gave his name so wide open that the people were only going to really learn who he was by going with him. That's how they were going to learn his name. As you go with me, you're going to learn that I am who I am. And so as they entered into the wilderness and even before that, they were learning who God was. How? Through their experience of following him. And so they learned things like he is God our healer, Jehovah Rapha. He is God my provider, Jehovah Jireh. He is the the Lord of angel armies, Jehovah Shaboth. What was going on? They were learning not just by hearing who he was like a name. They were learning by following with him. So do you know the God of adventure? Or do you just like align yourself with some denomination like Pentecostal, I'm Catholic, I'm Anglican, I'm Church of Ireland, I'm... Do you know the God of adventure? Because you only really know him as you walk with him. And this is, I'm trying to get this to you. This is what it's about. This is the heart of what God challenges us with today. So if there's one thing that I, I would like to get you to do is to refuse to surrender the adventure. Refuse to surrender the adventure. The adventure that God calls us to is, um, it's usually inconvenient. Sometimes I wish that God would just check my calendar. Like I have it online. He could just check it. And maybe he could send me a text message if he needs me to do something. Just send it a week ahead so I can, then I can put it in the calendar, make sure it doesn't conflict with something else, you know? We laugh, but wouldn't that be nice? Thanks. Wish you could just do the things my way. Doesn't work. Walking with God is an adventure, and there are surprises, and we have to kind of decide beforehand that we're going to be willing to be inconvenienced because that's what it is to follow him. You know, when Jesus would call these disciples, have you ever read the Gospels? I'm talking about Christianity, okay? Not just church, a big church and old people. I'm talking about Christianity. When Jesus would call people, he would call them like individuals. So God calls. He doesn't, he doesn't call them and you need to worry about them. He calls you. He knows you. And he says, hey, you, come follow me. Doesn't matter about them, doesn't matter about her, doesn't matter about him. You come follow me. And so then we in our situation, whatever our situation, we don't compare ourselves to anybody else. We have to say, am I going to follow him? And this was the situation with the disciples. Some of them had great jobs, really secure. They had their pension plan. And God said, come follow me. Jesus said, hey, come follow me. They decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to? I'm going to lay, okay, I'm going to leave that. Okay, I'm with you. And when he called them, what did he do? Jesus says, 
come follow me. And they're there, they hear it. And what does Jesus do? He just go. he's gone. He's walking. And they're like, okay, I better, am I going to follow him? The call of walking with God is inconvenient, okay? It's very clear in the scriptures. Read any of the scriptures, and it's um, going to be very often inconvenient. I, I come from a long line of adventurers. My parents are here. Give my parents a hand. <laughs> <I'm> g- <laughs> they hate that. But listen, I just, children, honor your parents in the Lord, for this is right, okay? But they, they bless me because they, they exemplified this to me as a young teenager. They, my dad was a doctor in Alaska. They felt called to go to a different country to share God's love with people. So my dad shut down his medical business. They sold their house, or they tried to sell it. Actually, even before they sold the house, they left because it wasn't selling fast enough. So they said, we better just go because God wants us to do this. So they left. And they, so they kept paying their mortgage while they were in this different country, helping the poor and orphans. And um, finally, they ran out of money. I think it was the same month that they ran out of money because they were paying their mortgage. The house sold. And, and so I come, both my, my family and Heather's family, we both have a heritage of people who have adventured with God. And that adventure doesn't always have to be like going to a different country and doing this missionary thing, but it does have to be an adventure with God. Sometimes the adventure is staying where you are, actually, and, but that's still an adventure. So I just want to share with you that because I plan to continue the adventure spirit, Mom and Dad. We're going to keep going with the Lord. And, and, and I think that God wants uh, all, all of us to have that, that even for you, that your children's children will look back and say, remember when grandpa and grandma, they did this, they helped do this, and now they were like this, but then they got to know God, and they did this, and it was hard, and there were challenges, and things didn't always work exactly the way they thought it should work, but they kept going. And that's the heritage. So we want to hold on to that. And we don't look back. This was the the other problem. It was inconvenient, but it was also a temptation to look back. That's what they were doing. But we were made, actually, to go forward. Have you ever looked at your toes? They're pointed forward, at least usually. Mine are pointed forward. My nose, it's pointed forward. I'm meant to go forward, not meant to look back. Don't look back. When God's brought you out, Don't look back to being stuck again in that bondage, in that slavery. It's not better. It might be hard here, but it's way better with God than it was there. Be with God. Stay with God, even when it's hard. Stop turning. You'll get, you'll hurt your, you'll tweak your nerves or something. Keep going forward. We're called to go forward. Don't go back. Israel was, they were being stuck in their past, and actually it stopped them from receiving what, God had for their future. Turning back actually was what stopped them from receiving what belonged to them. Do you see the danger? That's what I'm saying. Like, you need to check your oil because if you don't, it'll blow up the engine. If you're constantly looking back when you're meant to be moving forward, you might blow the engine. It's like it can be a problem. So God's called us to adventure. And I love in the scripture over and over talks to God's people, it says, I've given you a future and a hope. You know, you know that verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, I think it is, um, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Hope and a future is always about what's forward. It's not about looking back. God, I'm with you, even though it's hard, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard going forward, but I'm going forward. I'm going to move forward. So don't refu- do refuse to surrender the adventure. So Moses sent them in to make this report. And um, they all focused, on, the, the 10 of them focused on the negative. Two of them focused on the Lord. That's what he's called us to. And so because of that, 
For 40 years, they weren't able to enter into the promise that God had prepared for them. 40 years, they had to stay in the wilderness, stay into less than what was theirs. 40 years. Caleb then is now, he's 85 years old. And the, the other 10 have died off now. Caleb's an old, old man now. And, um, and it's crazy. Ants live. That's, that's my man, Caleb. He's so inspiring. 85 years old. He's like, I don't want the leather chair, the Netflix, the Sky Sports. Not that that's not good, but I want the land. I, he actually, literally, he's like, I want the fight. Give me the fight. And so the promise with God, just a reminder to you, that the promise with God is not only the land of milk and honey, the ever-boiling kettle, the easy chair. That's good. Those things are blessings. But also, along with those blessings is a battle. And there is an adventure. That's what you were made for. So I want to encourage you today, come on, drive it into them. Get in there. Get that. All right. Am I getting, I'm getting excited, too excited for you now. So this is the question. Will you choose? Will you choose? That's, that's the choice you get to make. You get to actually choose. Will you enter the promise or, and you're allowed to, stay in the wilderness? God invites you to adventure. It's actually his promise. Um, but it's not all just so simple and easy. But that's where the blessing is, and that's where he's going. So we get to choose. So choose a life of adventure with God. Take risks with God. And it's okay if you, get, like, if you come home with a bruise. Is that okay? You can get a bruise. It's all right. Sometimes it's good. You know, have you ever noticed, like, some of our best stories are horror stories? <laughs> like, Heather's, like, remember when I ra got ran over twice by that truck? And this was a story. Remember when we got held up with guns and knives? Remember how God came through with that? That's the stories we're looking for. Not necessarily, but that's what, that's what the situation is. <laughs> so the risk of you, I want to go where you're going. Lord, help me to walk with you. Help me to enter into the things that you have promised me. Help me not to be afraid. Help me not to magnify the problems, but to magnify you because you are with me. Give us a greater faith, Lord, to walk with you. Thank you for this word today, Lord, and thank you that we can be together. Pray you bless every person as we um, scatter out into the community, into our lives Father, may we take you with us, and you take us with you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody, we're finished with this part of the service.